Thank you. I'm going to stand right up here. I hope I'm not in anyone's way, but um, I still have the most runs batted in of anyone in the Animal Rights Hall of Fame. So, I, um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about why I'm, I'm here talking to you about nutrition. Here's me fishing in 1987. Uh, soon after the, this fishing trip, I, it disturbed me uh, what we were doing to the fish, and I started thinking about how humans treat animals. Uh, soon after that, a professor of mine at college had a copy of Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. So I read through that and thought, wow, a lot of this uh, resonates with me, that the way we treat animals isn't right. And then I started to learn more about how animals are factory farmed, which was obviously very disturbing. Um, and I went on to become vegan and then start an organization called Vegan Outreach. And what we do is we go around to colleges all over the country handing out booklets to get college students interested in veg eating. Here's our Adopt-A-College website. If anyone's at all interested in getting involved with that, please go to adoptacollege.org or veganoutreach.org and you can contact us about it. Um, because spreading ve nutrition is such an integral part of spreading veganism, um, no matter how you slice it, you, you end up talking about nutrition even if you're not interested in the health reasons. Um, it's still a major aspect of it. So I felt like I needed to become more uh, educated about nutrition, so I went back to school to get a registered dietitian degree, and then I ended up writing this book, Vegan for Life, with Jenny Messina, who's another animal activist who's a vegan health professional, and started the website veganhealth.org. And one of the main things that I've done is try to promote the idea that vegans should be supplementing with vitamin B12, which I'll talk a little bit about soon. Okay, so um, as Laura said, I'm here to talk to you about common questions that vegans get about nutrition. Um, so let's see if people can say this one with me. Where? 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 Yay, everyone knew. Okay, so the, the, a full-blown protein deficiency is known as Quasha Yorker. That's, uh, you can see that in children in, in countries where people are starving and they get a very bloated stomach. Um, no vegan is going to get that in the United States. That doesn't generally happen in the United States, except in extremely rare circumstances. So we are not in danger of getting Quasha Yorker. Um, however, there is a question of are we getting ideal amounts of protein, ideal amounts for us to build the most muscle we can build, or at least not have our muscles deteriorating, and um, making sure our bones stay healthy because muscle is very important for bone. I'm sorry, protein is very important for bones as well as making sure that we feel good. Some people feel better eating more protein than others. So the main way to determine if you're getting an ideal amount of protein is nitrogen balance studies. And what that does is it measures nitrogen is a molecule that's in protein that is not in carbohydrate and fat. And so what, what researchers do is they measure how much nitrogen you're either losing or gaining from your diet to determine if you're in nitrogen balance. And, and that can really tell you, okay, these people are in nitrogen balance or not. Unfortunately, we have not, there has not ever been a nitrogen, nitrogen balance study done on vegans, on free living vegans. So we don't actually have any real concrete evidence about how much protein vegans need. But we basically extrapolate from the RDA. So we figure out how much protein's in the food, what the RDA is, and how much we're getting on average. The RDA for about a 140 pound person is 51 grams of protein per day. And so here's some, just to give people an idea of how much protein is in various plant foods. To compare it to a Burger King burger, which is 380 calories, 19 grams of protein. A Whole Foods bean burrito has 10 grams of protein. Spaghetti, a cup, of spaghetti, cup and a half of cooked spaghetti has 12 grams. Tofurkey Italian sausage has 30 grams. So... Um, there you can see, if you eat two, two tofurkey sausages a day, you will be meeting the RDA for protein. You need to eat a little bit more of some of these other foods, and then most vegan foods are going to be around, you know, these lower amounts of protein. Tofurkey is an exception in that it's very high. Tofu is pretty high in protein. So can a vegan get too little protein? Well, possibly we can, and if, it's, if all you eat is, can you say it with me? Soda and... Chips, potato chips or french fries. Um, now that's kind of a myth that there are a lot of vegans out there eating nothing but soda and french fries, but I do like to point it out. And if that is all you eat, um, 
unless you eat just massive amounts of french fries, you could get your protein level might be too low. But that isn't the case for most of us. But there is a question of complete protein, and that is, are we getting all the essential amino acids? So there are certain amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein, and you need a certain... Um, some foods match the amounts in the same ratios that humans need them than other foods. And animal foods are particularly known as having the right ratios. So there becomes a question of what about the amino acids in, in incomplete proteins like plant proteins. So, um, oh wait, I meant to... Okay, so one thing to know is that all foods have all the essential amino acids, all plant foods. Some of them are, are lower in some amino acids than others. But sometimes we hear that some plant foods are devoid of some of the essential amino acids, and that's not true. They all have they all, have all of them. At least I've never seen a plant food that doesn't. Lysine is the limiting amino acid in vegan diet. So that's the one that we really have to pay attention to and make sure we're getting enough of for most people. So we need to include a few foods high in lysine. Legumes are the highest food in lysine for the most part, the, the most common foods. And there are a lot of legumes. Any soy food is a legume. Tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk, soy meats. Any kind of bean. Peas, including green peas and split peas. Lentils. Peanuts. Peanuts are a legume, not actually a nut. Quinoa is also high in lysine. It's not a legume, but it, it's very high in lysine and protein. Seitan is another one. Pistachios, pumpkin seeds and amaranth. I don't think probably any of us eat a whole lot of amaranth except for Mark Foy, who's in the audience tonight. Um, but um, <laughs> So if you just eat a few servings of these foods each day, you will be fine with your lysine. If you're, if you're an athlete, so I say two to three servings of high lysine foods per day. If you're an athlete, you need to eat a, a bit more, especially if you're a strength or speed athlete. If you're an endurance athlete, you will eat more because you're going to eat more food um, and you're just going to naturally get more lysine by eating more food, unless you avoid those foods. And, there are, and the reason I talk about this is that there are some diets, such as some raw foods diets, not all, where people might actually avoid almost all of those foods that I showed you as high in lysine. So it is possible. Um, older people should also err on the side of, whoops, I went the wrong way there. <laughs> older people should err on the side of high protein plant foods um, because your body, as we age, our bodies are not as good at assimilating uh, protein and we need to make sure we're not uh, causing any muscle wasting or bone wasting because we're not getting enough protein. And then if you find yourself getting colds more frequently than you would like or if it seems reasonable, you might need more protein because protein is what allows us to fight our immune system to fight colds. And here are some vegans getting enough protein. Ed Bauer, Derek Tracizi. Michelle Risley. And what I like to tell people who don't believe that vegans can get enough protein is to go check out veganbodybuilding.com, which has dozens and dozens of vegan bodybuilders. That is pretty convincing. Also, Vegan Outreach has a booklet called Compassionate Athlete. I'm not sure if we had any at our table out there. I think we should. Um, so if you're interested in the Compassionate Athlete booklet, it lists a bunch of good athletes that are vegans. And we find it very helpful to show people that you can be a great athlete and, and uh, vegan. Okay, so the next topic is people sending us links on Facebook or uh, through email saying that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. Who in here has gotten a link like that from a friend? I hope at least someone because I, I see a few ands. Um, well, every once in a while, a, study might, a paper might be published in which people are saying saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. So because it does happen from time to time, and I get people emailing me asking me about these articles, I wanted to talk a bit about that. So the traditional theory is that saturated fats from animal products increase LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol. That leads to atherosclerosis in our arteries, and then that leads to a heart attack after the, the plaques build up for a long period of time. Um, now there's been a few recent papers that have been published that take a bunch of studies and add them all together and look at the results that have suggested that this connection doesn't actually exist. Um, it has been a, a somewhat theoretical connection in, in many cases because there's a whole lot of research that shows saturated fats increase LDL cholesterol and there's a whole lot of research that shows LDL cholesterol increases atherosclerosis but there isn't as much research looking at saturated fats do they cause atherosclerosis. 
So there's been a bit of a debate about it. But based on the connections that I just described, the government in the 1950s, the government started suggesting that, that Americans reduce their intake of saturated fats. And that's been basically a, a common theme, as well as lowering your amount of fats to 30% of your calories. That's been a common theme since then. So from the, especially in the 1960s, it became a stronger, it was, it was more prevalent um, to, to the government to recommend that, and then through the 2000s. Now, some people are saying that these low-fat diets that have been promoted during this time has caused an increase in health problems, including heart disease, type 2 diabetes, I'm sorry, and obesity. Thanks. Um, and the message has been that carbohydrates kill. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about what the situation is in deaths from heart disease and, other, and these other diseases in the last 30 or 40 years. So here's a chart, and you don't really need to see the numbers so much. Um, it starts in 1979 on the left, and it goes to 2009. Um, and this is deaths from heart disease in the United States. And as you can see, it's gone way down. It's about 50% what it was. So regardless of what's been going on, deaths from heart disease have not been going up. And I wonder, how many people here knew that deaths from heart disease have gone down like this? Has anyone known that? A lot of times I've, I talk to vegans, I talk to vegans, uh, uh, people, uh, I'm sorry, audiences, and they are, have no idea that this is the case. So that's d deaths from heart disease is different than incidence of heart disease. Incidence of heart disease is much harder to measure because it's, it's uh, well, for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. But I looked, I tried to find the most comprehensive, uh, trustworthy source on incidence of heart disease to see what they were saying about it. And I found a paper from 2014 that I thought was not, people aren't connected with industry or anything like that, that, that I could tell. And their conclusion was that it, although a complete picture of the national trend in, in coronary heart disease incidence in the US remains elusive, the findings from a variety of studies uh, indicate that the incidence of coronary heart disease may have declined. So that's the status of the research at this point, is that we think that the incidence has gone down as well as death rates. Now, why would one go down? Um, I mean, why would there be any difference? Well, so one thing to be aware of is that LDL cholesterol has gone way down in the United States. And it started mostly in the, the first group of studies, which is the left, the dark bar on each side. That shows from 1976 to 1980 the amount of people that had high LDL cholesterol. And then in both the total men, women, and different age groups, it, it went down pretty far uh, starting in 1988, and then it's continued to go down since then. And a lot of that is due to the fact that people are using more cholesterol-lowering medications. This shows that it's the cholesterol-lowering medications has gone up a lot. So it doesn't mean that much about diet, but this chart shows that actually people have been following saturated fat guidelines much more, and the big change happened between 1980 and 1988. So now more people are following the saturated fat guidelines. If they have high cholesterol, they're taking the medications. Heart disease, is, their LDL is going down, and heart disease has gone down drastically. Also, there's been a lot of improvements in treating heart disease that once you have a heart attack. So. So how much of this change in heart disease is due to saturated fat? Here is the most trust, in my opinion, the most trustworthy review of the research to date. Uh, it's called the Cochrane Collaboration. They're a group of researchers that they try to keep up on all the research on a variety of different topics. Saturated fat being one of the important ones. Um, and they do massive uh, meta-analyses. Much hard, it's, it's much too hard for any individual to figure this stuff out because there's so much research on the topic. And so this is what they've determined. Um, uh, they so they included long-term trials suggesting that reducing dietary saturated fat reduces the risk of cardiovascular events by 17%. Um, re reduction of cardiovascular events was seen in studies that primarily replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat. No effects were seen if it was replaced with carbohydrates or protein. The degree of reduction in cardiovascular events was related to the degree of reduction of serum total cholesterol. So basically what they're saying is that if you replace saturated fat with other fats, not with carbohydrates or protein, 
the research shows that your risk for heart disease will go down by 17%, and, um, and, and that it's related to your cholesterol going down. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about vegans and cholesterol levels. Vegans on average, this is a study, one of the biggest studies of vegans in the world. It's an ongoing study. It's called EPIC Oxford. Uh, that stands for European Prospective Investigations into Cancer. Uh, it shows that on average meat eaters have, their diet is 32% fat, 12% of, of, of their diet is saturated fat. Um, they eat 2,200 calories and their average cholesterol is 204. Now if you go down to the vegans on the lower level, uh, fat intake is 29% on average. Saturated fat is as low as 66%. But if you look at the amount of saturated fat in grams, vegans are at 115 compared to 265 in the meat eaters. That's a huge difference. It's because we have a lower percentage of saturated fat and we have a lower in cal caloric intake. And then our average cholesterol in this study is 170. So there's a, a decent difference there. This, that was for men, this is for women. It's a very, fairly similar story, 195 versus 172. And then here was one other, other uh, uh, report that was done on a few different, a different group from Epic Oxford. And they found that vegans' average cholesterol was 158. This was, uh, I'm pretty sure this was only, yeah, in men. And the average meat eater was 191. So vegans are definitely having a big difference in cholesterol levels. Now, if you look at heart disease, the heart, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, was that involving statin drugs? No. I mean, I don't, I don't think any of the meat eaters were taken out if they were on statins. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look. But the vegans were not. You, yeah, the vegans are not on statins. Those are just free-living people who are vegan. We can, we can assume that most of those vegans are not on statins. That's been a very common finding. Most research that looks at vegan diets have shown that a vegan diet lowers your cholesterol levels. It's really not controversial at all to my, I mean, I've never heard anyone object to that idea. Yes. So we haven't actually studied the heart disease rates of vegans, believe it or not. Um, but we have done vegetarians, which includes vegans. So most of these people were lacto-ovo vegetarians. This is from Epic Oxford, and the vegetarians had a much lower risk of, heart, of getting heart disease. Uh, they had basically a 31% reduced risk, and it was highly statistically significant, um, so it wasn't just due to random chance. Um, okay, so now looking, so what is the deal with um, other things? So we covered heart disease. What about obesity? They, people also say, well, these low-fat diets are what's caused obesity. All right, so here are the, is the caloric intake in the, in the United States. You can see that there was kind of a big jump around 1988 again, 80 to 88. Uh, and then it's been slightly going down lately. Um, anyway, so let's, there's that. And here's body mass index. Body mass index is a way to measure your uh, body weight in, in, with respect to your height. You want a body mass index between about uh, 20 and 25. Above 25 is considered overweight, obese is considered 30 or more. And you can see that where the caloric intake kind of went up, the body mass index did as well. There's, I couldn't find any data past 2002, which is kind of unbelievable, but I wasn't able to find it uh, for the U.S. as a population. So it looks like as caloric intake went up, body mass index went up. Now let's look at vegans' body mass indexes. Vegans have, on average, in the Adventist Health Study 2, which is the, the other study other than Epic Oxford, of a very large amount of vegans. There's two studies ongoing right now <coughs> looking at vegans. So uh, the vegans had a body mass index of 23.6 compared to 28.8 for the meat eaters. So the meat eaters are approaching obesity on average, whereas the vegans are right in the middle of what's considered healthy. Uh, the other study, Epic Oxford, has similar findings with vegans at 22.5 and 22 for men and women compared to 24 and 23.5 for the meat eaters, men and women. So um, the difference for the women wasn't huge, but for the men it was a decent amount. So it looks like if you're worried about obesity uh, and the problems that can sometimes stem from that, a vegan diet is a good way to keep your caloric intake down. Now here is the uh, prevalence of diagnoses of type 2 diabetes. 
in the United States. You see that there was kind of a jump in 1997. They changed the criteria for determining what people have type 2 diabetes, and that can be responsible for some of that jump there. However, it has since then steadily gone up, as you can see. Here, and then here is uh, diabetes rates of vegans and other diet groups. Vegans had, in, they were, in the Adventist study, they were followed for two years, which isn't very long, but um, they found that over, after two years, the vegans had a 62% reduced risk of being diagnosed with diabetes, which is a huge difference. Um, they, adjusted for, they adjusted these results for many things, age, even body mass index, um, which generally it's thought that your, as your body mass increases, your risk of type 2 diabetes, that's a direct correlation. So, but even adjusting for body mass index, vegans have a lower risk. Um, and that's, it's a, it was a very highly statistically significant finding. I don't have the stats up there, but it was uh, pretty impressive. So the, my conclusion is that increased saturated fat from animal products likely causes heart disease. That seems to be, we can be somewhat confident in that. Increased calories, whether they be fats, carbohydrates, protein, or alcohol, increases body mass index and type 2 diabetes. Vegan diets reduce risk for all these things. Okay, and that was it. That was the, the conclusion. So vegans are doing pretty good in terms of this, these sorts of diseases. And so we don't have to worry that our low fat, we, that we need to eat a paleo diet because we got to have our red meat because we need it to be healthy. Um, now, we do get a lot of questions about a paleo diet, and I'm not going to spend much time on it because really what I just covered pretty much applies to the paleo diet. If, if you're eating a bunch of red meat because you want, you're on a paleo diet, then everything I just covered is going to apply to you in, for the most part, unless you're eating a very low-calorie paleo diet, which is possible. So one thing I like to tell people that bring up paleo diet is if you're really serious about eating like our paleolithic ancestors, you should be eating insects. And most paleo dieters are not, though there are some that are. But anyway, I, I took this quote from um, a blog called Paleo Veganology. It was a paleo, uh, someone who studies paleolithic diets, and they, they have a blog. And I find it very, they, they do a good job of looking at the evidence. And this is what they say is that... Um, Bug eating was a big part of the paleo diet. So it's something to keep in mind to remind people if they talk about that. Okay, so um, vitamin B12 is a question we get a lot about. And um, it is one nutrient that vegans really need to get from fortified foods or supplements. Low B12 intakes can eventually cause dementia and worse. You can, um, you can actually get par paralysis if you continue to get lower B12 uh, as your B12 levels go down, you start to get tingling in your fingers and toes, um, and that, that can lead to further paralysis in your body. And if you don't correct it, you can die from B12 deficiency. But you can also, if you just get moderately low intakes over your whole life, you can end up with dementia. So it's something to be concerned about, and a lot of people are out there saying, even today, that uh, vegans really don't need B12, I haven't had B12 in years, and I'm totally fine. So it's not a risk worth taking, in my opinion. Um, vitamin B12 is produced by bacteria in feces. So our, our, as a human and pretty much all mammalian feces uh, have lots of bacteria that produce vitamin B12. So if you're eating food that's contaminated with feces, uh, you can get vitamin B12 through contamination, though, and probably in small amounts. Um, B12 can't reliably be obtained from fermented food, algae, or seaweeds, although there are a lot of rumors that, they, that it can be. So don't chance it, is in my opinion. Um, a lot of primates eat their feces, and it's not something I'm recommending. So we could get it naturally, but uh, it's probably best to avoid getting it that way. Fortified foods and supplements made from the bacteria is uh, the way to go. So the, that raises the question, well, is a vegan diet natural? If we have to take B12 for fortified foods and supplements, does that mean a vegan diet isn't natural? So here's my opinion. Um, I, I think that human populations have been omnivores. Humans have eaten anything they can get their hands on that's edible, for the most part, throughout our history. There was no group of prehistoric humans that decided, we really care about animals, we're going to go vegan, and you know, we went on and, and we were just completely vegan. We've always eaten small amounts of animal products where we could find it, anything else. Yes, question in the back. Eat to get 
Okay. I think everyone heard his question, so I won't repeat it. Um, th there's no best brand for vitamin B12. Pretty much, I mean, unless you're talking about methylcobalamin versus cyanocobalamin. And I think I have a slide coming up with that, but I guess I could cover it right now. There's, there's a few different types of B12 that um, are being promoted. Cyanocobalamin is the, the uh, traditional type that's found in fortified foods and supplements for the most part. It's because cyanocobalamin is a very stable molecule and it's easy, it won't degrade if you put it in, in these things. Whereas there's two other versions, methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin, which is, has, goes by many different names. Sometimes it's called coenzyme B12, um, dibencozide. And some natural health practitioners suggest, and supplement companies, suggest that you can't rely on cyanocobalamin. You need these other versions, which are more expensive. I disagree with that. Unless you're someone who's had cyanide poisoning, and you can pretty much, have, if you don't know that you've had cyanide poisoning, you can assume you don't have it. Um, then you can rely on cyanocobalamin. It's a very well-studied molecule. It's been in many, many trials. It shows it, it corrects B12 deficiency. If you have B12 deficiency and you take cyanocobalamin, it will improve. Um, so I don't think you need to waste your time worrying about methyl and the other one uh, because it's just, it's, you know, it's just unnecessary. So then the other question was, I don't think there's any particular brand that's better than the other. Um, you know, every once in a while a supplement company will be found to be doing bogus things. And, I, you know, most, most B12 has B12, and, and you just shouldn't stress yourself out about worrying about it. Um, yes? I missed your answer on the acceptable form of B12. Can you emphasize it? Cyanocobalamin is what I recommend. And it's what's going to be in most supplements and fortified foods. All fortified foods are going to have cyanocobalamin. And, he, and the gentleman in the back asked about what f is the best fortified food for B12. Um, probably nutritional yeast, but you should make sure that it hasn't been sitting out in the light. You want, because B12 degrades when it's exposed to light. So you want to, if you buy nutritional yeast, keep it in your refrigerator. But it tends to have, it has to be fortified nutritional yeast for one thing. It, it's not naturally in it, but there is at least one company, Red Star, and maybe some others, they come and go over the years that have fortified nutritional yeast. Usually it's a decent amount, so you can rely on it, uh, that you're getting plenty by sprinkling it on your food. And it tastes pretty good. Yes? So, um, the claim is often made that you know, contamination of soil, like that vegetables will be contaminated with soil. Right. No, that, there's not any evidence that you can get B12 through, through plants grown in contaminated soil. There's been, there were some rumors about that, I looked into the research and it, you, you, there was no, that research actually didn't exist. Now there have been a few studies where researchers have taken plants, carefully placed B12 in the soil, and plants will absorb the B12 because it's a water soluble, soluble molecule. So if you stick a bunch of B12 next to a plant's roots, it's going to take it up. But why bother cycling it through the plant when you can just take the supplement? That's like, take, that's like, taking, multi, that's like taking multivitamins, crushing them up, throwing them around a plant, and then waiting for the plant to absorb it so you can eat the plant. So, yeah. It, and you can't rely it on it. On, 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 um, organic food has not been shown to be a, a good source of B, vitamin B12, even if it's grown in feces. Yes? Oh, uh, you, you really need to, so the question is how much nutritional yeast do you need? You just have to look at the label and, and figure out how much you want to take uh, to get the RDA. Um, I, I, I'm going to have recommendations in a second about how much B12 you need. Then you just have to extrapolate it to wh how much is in that particular food. Um, what is your opinion of uh, arindaline as a source of vitamin B12? A root? A what? Arindaline. I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it, but there is no research on any plant food that has shown that a food, plant food can improve vitamin B12 status in humans. So if you hear that a plant food is a good source of B12, it, there's no research to back it up. Just so, and if there ever is, I'm going to talk about my blog in a, in a, at, towards the end, and you can sign up for my blog, and then if there ever is research like that, I will publish it on the blog. Um, Okay, so here's a quote that I like. It's from a, a website called beyondveg.com. It used to be, it's pretty out of date these days, but it used to be a very good website for uh, information on 
comparative anatomy and physiology, but I really like this quote from the, the author. You really don't need the naturalness claim to be a vegetarian or vegan. That is, moral or spiritual reasons are alone or adequate to justify following a vegetarian or vegan diet. Assuming the diet works for you, of course. Further, if the motivation for your diet is moral or spiritual, then you will want the basis of your diet to be honest as well as compassionate. In that case, ditching false myths of naturalness presents no problems. Indeed, ditching false myths means that you are ditching a burden. And that is certainly what I've found to be the case. Um, so I don't get into arguments about whether these teeth can tear woolly mammoths apart or other various things, how long our intestines are. Because I don't think, I, I mean, humans, we clearly do better on primarily plant foods. That doesn't, that's not even really controversial, except among small segments of the population. So we probably ate mostly plant foods in our history, but we probably also ate any animal foods we could get our hands on. Yes? Exactly. We are evolving our diet. Very true. So there's a question of, I already covered B12, um, thanks to the question, but do supplements work? We, all, we hear often in the media that supplements don't work. They're useless. So I'm going to break that down a little bit. Antioxidant supplements don't prevent cancer to, to, to date. There's been none that do. In fact, if anything, it's not a good idea to take it for cancer. So that is definitely true. And so if someone says, um, but, if, but that's not all supplements. All supplements are not antioxidant supplements. Uh, you also will hear that calcium supplements don't prevent osteoporosis. Okay, so w that is when taken in addition to a normal 1,000 milligrams of calcium per day. So if you're someone who already gets 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day, adding more calcium on top of that, it's not going to do anything for you. It, there's a very trans transitory effect where for a very short period of time you're your bone breakdown might look a little bit better, but that, that seems to then pass, and then it doesn't continue that way. So yeah, calcium supplements for preventing osteoporosis in most people are not promoted any longer. However, there are, vegans often get 500 milligrams or less per day, and there is evidence that vegans should make sure they're getting 700 to 1,000, and in that case, calcium supplements could be, uh, and I would recommend taking them. Um, and then as I covered, cyanocobalamin version of vitamin B12 definitely improves vitamin B12 status of the people who take it. Um, you might have heard of vitamin K. Uh, that's another one that Paleolithic uh, community promotes is why you have to eat animal foods. There are two forms. K1 is found in green leafy vegetables. So vegans are covered there as long as you're eating them. Uh, K2 is menaquinone. It's found in animal tissues, intestinal bacteria. We all, unless you've had uh, antibiotics that have killed off your intestinal bacteria to some extent and maybe have killed the, K, the K2 producing ones, then you probably are getting plenty of K2 through those intestinal bacteria. Um, and then natto is a, uh, what I hear is a disgusting soy product, fermented soy product that has tons of K2. And you're, the, the versions of, MK, uh, of K2 that you want are MK4 through MK9. It's very... Not too user friendly. Um, so I'm going to cover K2 and what the differences are. In blood clotting, there is absolutely no difference between K1 and K2. Uh, that is traditionally what K, vitamin K is the most, people are the most concerned about is blood clotting. It helps your blood, uh, uh, well, clot. Uh, heart disease, there's mixed evidence. Supplements are better than animal products. So there is some evidence, it's only from one country and it is not completely consistent, but there's been two or three studies, and it depends on how they're looking at it, that have shown that K2 reduced the risk of heart disease. Uh, however, supplements are probably better to take than animal products, and even the researchers that did that research said, this doesn't mean everyone should start eating animal products for heart disease. It means you should probably take K2 supplements, if, and, and if this is even true, because it really takes a lot of research before something like this can be shown to be the case. These were done on population studies, and it wasn't uh, just not conclusive. Um, and as, you, as I covered earlier, vegans have uh, a lot of benefits. There's a lot of benefits with, with heart disease anyway. Uh, in terms of bones, there's some evidence that K1 supplements can reduce bone fractures, and there's no studies comparing K1 to K2. There is a clinical trial on K2 that the last I looked had not been published yet, so we might know a little bit more about whether K2 can help bones. 
Um, and like I said, many, many people are, are, most of us are getting K2 from intestinal bacteria. Um, so what about soy and breast cancer? Here's the research on soy and breast cancer looking at population studies. In 2006, there was a meta-analysis of 17 studies in which the people with the highest soy intake had a slightly lower risk of breast cancer. But the largest intake was only about one serving per day. And if you're vegan, you might be eating a lot more than one serving per day. So there's a question of, well, what about higher servings? Well, in 2009, there was a study in China uh, that found that women eating three servings per day cut their risk of breast cancer in half, and it was highly statistically significant. Uh, so that was good news. Um, and then there was, there's also been research done on women with breast cancer who eat soy after they're diagnosed and what their outcomes are and whether soy seems to, to harm them or not. The, healthy women, the Women's Healthy Eating and Living Study uh, authors of that report said, our study is the third epidemiological study to report no adverse effects of soy foods on breast cancer prognosis. Oops. These studies taken together, which vary in ethnic composition, two were from the United States, one from China, and by level and type of soy consumption, provide the necessary epidemiological evidence that clinicians no longer need to advise against soy consumption for women diagnosed with breast cancer. What they're saying is that your doctor, if you have breast cancer, no matter what kind you have, your doctor should not say, you, should, you shouldn't be eating soy, um, even though lots of doctors are still doing that. So what about, maybe these, these authors are kind of wacko, um, what about the American Cancer Society? They say, even though animal studies have shown mixed effects on breast cancer with soy supplements, Studies in humans have not shown harm from eating soy foods. Moderate consumption of soy foods appears safe for both breast cancer survivors and the general population and may even lower breast cancer risk. Avoid soy supplements until more research is done. So that is their, their position, which is very consistent with that last report and the rest of the research. If you are interested in more info on vegan health, I have this uh, website, veganhealth.org, and I have all my recommendations for what I think vegans need to pay attention to in the top link on the left, recommendations. It'll take you to a, a, a page that says these are the seven nutrients that you should be aware of, and this is how you can get them, and if you're not getting them in any of these ways, you might want to start. Whoops. What did I do there? I guess that was the end. And I also have a blog at jacknorrisrd.com uh, if you want to go there and uh, sign up for my blog. Any research that comes out on vegan health or vegetarian health that I find at all relevant, I publish what it said and um, I try to be concise. And um, then I also put it on veganhealth.org so that there's one place that people can go to and see all this research. And if there's any other questions, I think we have a few minutes. Let me see what time it is. I don't know what time it is. So we've got 15 minutes if anyone has any. Let me, uh, I'll go to you next. Is there, what about the vegan diet and cancer risk? Uh, yes, there has been research recently that has shown that, that vegans have, both the two big studies looking at vegans have shown that vegans have a somewhat lower risk. I think it's about 10 to 15, 15 to 18% lower risk than regular meat eaters. We don't necessarily have a lower risk than people who eat, only eat fish or semi-vegetarians. But regular meat eaters, we have, the research so far shows that we have a lower risk of general cancer. Um, yes, and then you had a question? Okay. I should, you know, they say coffee prevents this, 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 but the facts are that I can't, there are people that are totally against coffee, and also what do you think of animals? Okay, what do I think about coffee first, whether it's healthy or not? Uh, coffee is very, is studied a lot, there's a lot of research on it. It seems to me that it's been mostly positive, coffee has a lot of antioxidants, but I don't know the research that well. I don't keep up on it and, and analyze all the studies. So I, I, you would need to go to a better source than me if you really want to know for sure. But that's my impression of the research. And then the other thing is, what do I think of enemas? And I don't have thoughts on enemas. Sorry. I don't follow enemas at all. Um, yes, let, let me start here. Yes. Okay, what, the question is, what about saturated fats like coconut oil? And, and that's going to be a very small part of the study, the research that I talked. Most of that research is, it would, those people would be eating animal fats. 
Um, it's, it's a, there's a question of whether medium chain triglyceride saturated fats are good or bad for you. The research that to date basically shows that coconut oil can raise your cholesterol levels, but coconut itself will lower it. And it hasn't, it's not, I would not say it's completely conclusive, but I would say that if you have high cholesterol and you're trying to lower it, then don't opt for coconut oil. Try to minimize your coconut oil and coconut milk. Um, I, I think eating some, you know, small amounts is fine. If you don't have high cholesterol, then I think it's fine to eat moderate amounts more regularly. And if you have very low cholesterol or you found that going vegan, it, say some people who, sometimes people eat a very low fat diet and after a few months or years of doing that, they find that their sex drive goes away among some other things. And those people can benefit from eating, probably, they will probably benefit from eating saturated fat. I know anecdotally some people do. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. It really depends on where you're at and what you want to do to your cholesterol levels, in my opinion, uh, with that. And, okay, yes. Um, have you seen studies uh, that try to assess relative risk of uh, heart disease and cancer, contribution of uh, nutrition versus genetics, either twin studies or mm -hmm. other? So the question is, do I know of research comparing nutrition versus genetics? I mean, I haven't seen that teased out in any significant way. Um, they seem to be synergistic, uh, but yeah, I, I can't really comment too much on that because I, I don't know the research very well. Um, yeah. Yes? I know a dozen vegans, and not one of them became vegan because of environmental concerns. They all became vegans, including myself, because of a health crisis. I had to drop dairy foods. I was a vegetarian for years, so I became a vegan. The other people, none of them did it for environmental reasons, and yet most of the speakers I heard today mention environmental reasons for becoming vegans. I don't get that. Okay, well, please talk to the conference organizers about that. <laughs> Adam, yes, you've been... Yes, yeah, so soy for men. I mean, I'm not, I think that three to five servings of soy a day should be fine for most people. Um, there's no exact amount that we know is, is better or worse. If you, there have been two anecdotal reports in the liter, scientific literature of men eating massive amounts of soy that did, one person got uh, sensitive breast tissue, and actually, they, you know, people said that, say that soy causes man boobs. Well, one guy actually did kind of get that. Um, and then another guy got erectile dysfunction from eating a lot of soy. But those are probably very unusual cases. They may be very sensitive because there's a lot of research on, say, prostate cancer in men, giving them soy supplements, where they get much, much higher doses of isoflavones, which is the estrogen component of soy, um, than what these people were even eating, and way more than anyone eating just a few servings of soy a day. And those men, for the most part, have had maybe one percent have had any problems in, in this regard. So there may be a few people that are that are sensitive, but and I would never recommend you eat ten servings of soy a day. I would definitely, I would say, limit it to five. Um, you know, there are some of these bodybuilders that have, have eaten much more than that, and they seem fine. So it, it really, it's probably an individual thing. Did that answer your question, Adam? Okay, um, let me ask someone who hasn't, you haven't asked one yet. Right. So all your cells should be able to do that conversion and the only time I would say that that isn't, some people come down with uh, serious B12 deficiency and they, and they may have a, a B12 metabolic problem where their body isn't converting it. But generally, B12, B12 in food isn't methylcobalamin. It's generally a different form. So you aren't even getting it. Say meat eaters aren't getting, aren't getting a majority of their B12 as methylcobalamin. They're getting generally hydroxycobalamin. Um, and it's, yeah, it's not, you, all, you also have to convert the methyl to the other coenzyme form, but your body does that fairly readily. You have enzymes to do that and mechanisms to do it. So it's nothing to worry about unless you have a particular problem. Um, and, and being vegan wouldn't have anything to do with that. 
So there are people out there with B12 problems that they just, they're genetically, they don't do, you know, their body doesn't treat B12 the way everyone else's does, but it has nothing to do with being vegan. Is there any reason not to take methylcobalamin? There kind of is because it's not as stable a molecule and it's not clear how much methylcobalamin you need. So um, some research has shown that it, does, from the 1971, I think, showed that it was absorbed just the same as other forms of B12. But then um, other reports have shown that maybe you need 1,000 to 1,500 micrograms a day, which is way more than what you would need for cyanocobalamin. Uh, so yeah, I think it's best to stick with cyano because we just know how much people need with a pretty precise, pretty precisely. Uh, only people, um, if you can't absorb B12, there's something called pernicious anemia where your body doesn't absorb B12. That has nothing to do with, with being vegan. And those people often get injections. However, there is research showing that if you eat large amounts uh, orally, you can get enough B12 from it. But it's not a vegan issue. It's, you know, every nutrient, there's going to be some people that can't metabolize that nutrient. B12 is fairly common, but because of the mechanism to absorb it efficiently, yes? What's the most of a whole coconut you can have at one time? Can you have a whole coconut at one time, half a coconut uh, at one time? I don't know. I don't know that, that answer. How much coconut can you have at once? I think the research showing that it lowers your cholesterol levels is probably on moderate amounts of coconut, small amounts. Um, but I don't remember how much it actually was. And for soy, I've heard that um, if it's fermented, but not if it's uh, prepared, like tofu is too prepared. Maybe no, there's no difference in the research on whether soy is fermented or not. That's usually what some of the, the pro-animal product people say, that fermented soy is good for you, but not unfermented soy is bad for you. There's, no, there's nothing to back that up. So the only difference is that you can absorb zinc somewhat better from fermented soy, from tempeh, but that's the only difference that I'm aware of. Did you have a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do you it? how do I handle nutrition questions? Well, I mean, if I'm lucky, it's something... So it's probably a little easier, right. how do you train other people to, to handle... Uh, it's, not, you know, it's not that easy to know. I mean, I basically... Vegan Outreach, I don't actually go out in, into the schools very often and hand out the booklets like, everyone, like the, the, a lot of our outreach coordinators do. And so I don't, I, I don't get that much public interaction with people. It's more people I just know that will ask me questions. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons I gave this talk, was to hopefully at least help inform people so they feel more confident. And if you want, uh, if, it feel, if you feel like you want to study up on it more, go to veganhealth.org and, and read up on some of these issues. And, and there's other resources, too, but I can vouch for what's on veganhealth.org. Um, you know, it's not easy, because people have a million different questions, and then they have their own idea. I mean, luckily for me, if I meet someone that, you know, kind of is really trying to tell me what is what I can usually, if I feel like they don't know, because once in a while someone, I'll meet someone that knows as much or more than a nutritional issue than I do, but if I think that they're just full of you know, hot air, then I can, I can usually let them know pretty quickly that they have no idea what they're talking about just by asking them a question about that they should, that's basic that they should know, but that's not going to help it, most people in talk. What I used to do with people that would ask me about protein is I'd say, which amino acid do you feel is deficient in a vegan diet? And that would usually shut them right up. They'd be like, I don't even know an amino acid. It'd just be, you know, they, if they do have the answer, then you know you're dealing with someone who, yes? Um, do you know of any research or any information about the effects of um, soy-based tortillas on metabolism? Like, is there any research? Yeah, soy-based formula is a little trickier because you're, the baby is getting so much isoflavones compared to what an adult eating a few servings is. And that there is a lot of research tracking that. And some babies, you know, are allergic to soy. For the most part, soy infant formula seems to be safe, and I do have some links on my website that would give you more details than what I can remember off the top of my head, but generally it should be safe. Uh, let me see if someone has any, you haven't asked a question or anything. I, I missed the beginning part of the Okay. Oh. How much protein does a male Well, a 140 pound person needs on average about 51 grams. And there's an there's a idea. Well, that's the RDA. 
And the RDA is, gives it a buffer of safety. So most people really don't need 51. They need somewhat less, maybe 65% of that, I think, if I'm remembering correct. It's definitely not more than 85% of that. Um, and if you're trying to build muscle mass, though, no, you might need more, especially in the beginning of a weight training program. You would probably want it to err on the side of more. Maybe a, an easy way to do it would be a protein supplement of 20 grams or eating an extra tofurkey sausage or something like that. Um, it's not hard to get it, but you, you probably could use a little more if you're just starting. So plant-based protein is basically going to be the same for you as well? Uh, I wouldn't go that far if you're, um, I mean, it really depends on how, uh, if, you know, there's some bodybuilders get really technical about their protein intake, and then there's going to be a little bit of difference between, say, whey protein and soy protein. Whey protein has a higher of one of the amino acids that is particularly important for building muscle. So you might need to eat a little extra soy protein than you would whey protein. But this is really technical. I mean, if you're going to be a professional bodybuilder or a weightlifter, this is important. For most people, it's, even if you're, like, I, I lift weights very regularly, um, and uh, I don't worry about this stuff pretty much. I mean, I, I make sure I get enough protein, but I don't, I don't have to sit there and measure it or anything like that. And I don't, I don't take protein powder. Um, I just eat some soy each day is really how I get most of it. So, yeah, you're welcome. And let me make sure I get everyone. Um, and you, sir. And then you. Is soy protein safe for men? I heard that soy protein is not safe for men. Is soy protein safe for men? Yeah, that's my question. Yes, it is safe. Unless you have an allergy, it is safe for men. Soy is safe for men. The research has shown that it may reduce the risk for prostate cancer. So yes, it is safe. There's, at least there's, there's no evidence that it's not. Uh, did you have a question back there? Yeah, I think you've answered. Uh, yes. That's true of all supplements and all vitamins and minerals and all food. You, you absorb some of it, and you excrete some of it, and you, you don't absorb most of it. No, you, you, when you eat, uh, it's not necessarily true of macronutrients, which are fat, carbohydrate, and protein, but any, any micronutrient, when you eat a food, you don't absorb all the, nu the nutrients in it. That's just not the way it works. You absorb a small percentage of it, and then depending on which it is, most of them you will urinate, urinate out some of it as well, because you don't need it. So, yeah, she's right it, to the... Your friend is right saying that you don't absorb all the B12 in a supplement, but that doesn't matter. You absorb what you need from it. So, For B12, if you're only eating small amounts of vitamin B12 from fortified foods and supplements, you should eat it twice a day. Um, and I actually didn't have my B12 recommendations. I thought I had a slide. I have two different nutrition presentations, and the other one tells you exactly how much B12 you need. But if you go to veganhealth.org, under the recommendations, it tells you exactly how much you need. If you're only getting it from fortified foods or supplements, you should eat them twice a day because your body's not going to absorb that much. But if you're taking a multivitamin, which is, or I'm sorry, a B12 supplement, you're getting a, so much more B12 than you need that you will absorb plenty, to only, that you only need it twice a week. I recommend... 1,000 micrograms twice a week if that's how much you're taking. And now your average supplement, your average fortified food is probably going to have more like 2 micrograms, 1 to 2 micrograms. So you should eat it twice a day because there's so, so little, such a little amount. But, sorry? Mm -hmm. eat, just, yeah, you don't even need both. You need one or the other. Yes, let me, uh, I don't, have you, yes. Um, I don't remember if you mentioned vitamin D at all. No, this isn't really my, my talk about what nutrients vegans need to be paying attention to. And I think that uh, because we don't, vegans don't eat many fortified foods with B12, such as uh, omnivores will drink milk that's fortified with B12 in the United States. So they get a bit more, vi I'm sorry, vitamin D. They get a more vitamin D through that. And then fish oil has small amounts of vitamin D, and some, I think, eggs have small amounts of vitamin D. So you can get small amounts of vitamin D through certain foods. 
But, um, and we could get it through mushrooms, actually. If mushrooms are treated to UV rays, if you ever see in the grocery store mushrooms claiming that they have vitamin D, they actually do have vitamin D, and, and they can get quite, quite large amounts, actually. But they have to be specially, they had to be set, sat out in the sun, and so your average mushroom probably doesn't. Um, but, so, vegans can get it through foods. It, I don't, um, during the winter, I think it's a good idea for vegans to take a vitamin D supplement, and I talk about that on veganhealth.org under the recommendations. You should probably take 1,000 international units a day, and that's probably true of just about anyone who lives in, in the, who doesn't live in a tropical climate and get out in the sun fairly regularly, that you should take a vitamin D supplement, especially in the winter. So it's not really that much of a vegan issue. Um, lots of people get vitamin D deficiency because their body just doesn't synthesize it well. And whether you're meat eater or vegan, but vegans do sometimes come down with vitamin D deficiency. In fact, if you, if you start feeling like you have pain all over your body and your bones, you might have vitamin D deficiency. But it happens to everyone. I mean, it doesn't happen to everyone, but it happens to every, people in every diet group. Okay. It, it probably doesn't happen anywhere near to everyone. I, I misspoke <laughs> when I said that. Um, yes. You, yes, in the green shirt. Good qu- the question is, should a, should a new vegan especially get laboratory tests done to know if their uh, diet has been helping them? I would say no. I don't think there's anything that vegans need to go get tested. The one exception would be for menstruating women who are endurance runners. I think that it would be a good idea to keep your iron, mo- your iron checked occasionally to make sure that you're not starting to drop down fast. Uh, so other than that group of people, I wouldn't worry about getting tested for anything. If, you start, if you're going vegan because you want to lower your cholesterol levels, then you want to get your cholesterol levels tested to see if it's working. I would definitely do that. And of course, it's good to, if you're young to get a certain, go get a physical and get certain tests done, cholesterol and that sort of thing, and blood sugar every five years. And then as you get older, you might do it more often, whatever your doctor recommends. But you don't need to go get your B12 tested. That's definitely something vegans don't need to do. Um, if you're going to get tests done, it's never a bad idea to get your vitamin D thrown in there, whether you're, no matter who you are, because, like I said, some people do come down with vitamin D deficiency and sometimes severe vitamin D deficiency. So you want to know if that's happening to you. But, you know, I, I don't think anyone needs to go out of their way to do that unless they, they think they have a problem. Um, yes? About iodine? Iodine, I don't think you need to run out and get your... I mean, if you get your thyroid tested every five years or so, like people should, whether they're vegan or not, just to make sure nothing's wrong. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the government recommendations are for getting your thyroid checked. I just think I like to get it checked every five years just to make sure. So iodine is something that vegans should be taking. Uh, Iodine helps the thyroid stay healthy. And um, if you don't, if you you can get, get it through seaweed, if you eat seaweed two or three times a week, or if you eat iodized salt, which is how a lot of Americans get their iodine, then you should be fine. Uh, if you don't do either of those things, taking a kelp supplement is what I would recommend. Taking it one, two to three, uh, two to three times a week, taking a kelp supplement, which is what I do. Uh, so yeah, iodine is something to be aware of, and it's on my recommendations at veganhealth.org. Okay. Yeah. Okay, should I finish now? Yeah. Or yeah. one more, or just done now? Do you have one first this, this lady has not asked a question yet. Uh, not many. I mean, when, when I, the research I showed where they compared meat eaters to lacto vegetarians to semi-vegetarians to fish eaters to regular meat eaters, that's pretty much all the differences are right there in the definitions. They, some of those studies will say, okay, well, what food was associated with this as well as the diet, and we'll look at that, but they don't adjust for other dietary factors. They do adjust for lots of other things like exercise, smoking, age, gender, uh, and a host of other things. Those, those studies do a pretty good job in most of those reports of, of doing that. So, are there any studies that you have done? Uh, there's clinical trials, but th- those are different. Um, 
but not on populations of vegans. Those are the best. What I showed you was the best and the most concise that they've gotten in terms of defining what the diets are. Yes. And that's all, they, that's all the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for letting me talk so long. Thank you so much. Hi. I've been waiting two days to ask you my question. Okay. Let me, let's let them, t I will, uh, I'll talk to you in a bit. You're welcome. Thank you. No, it's really your question. I work in a hospital. It's really refreshing to listen to a registered dietitian that comes from that, that uh, kind of setting because uh, it's very frustrating for me to work in a hospital. And a lot of times I'll, I work with uh, veterans after they've had heart conditions at my nurse. And oftentimes I'll talk to the veterans and they'll say, oh no, I've already talked to my dietitian, I'm good. And usually the dietitian is not somebody like Jack Norris. You know, they're following the standard American diet protocol, you know, chicken, fish, you'll be fine. But anyways, I just want to kind of wrap up the remarks here. It, it's been a great festival. I really want to thank everybody from the steering committee to the volunteers, to all of our sponsors, and to all of our food vendors, and especially for you, because this is why we're doing it. So thank you so much. And Laura, you did a fabulous job up there. Uh, we're the San Francisco Veg Society, and uh, we're an all-volunteer organization. So it's really good to support us, and one way you can do that is to become a member. I know a lot of you guys are members already. And one of the things we really wanted to do this year was to give back to our members, so we made it free. And we're, we're going to do that from now on. And the World Veg Fest is free for our members, you know. And uh, so we're really thankful for our members for uh, helping put this on. Uh, not much more. I, oh, okay. So my wife, Patty, she's been a huge part of this as well. So if you see her, please thank her. She's done a lot. She's not in the room, but I'll tell her that you guys are popping. She wanted me to mention that if you hashtag, if, you, if you've taken pictures and you send them to hashtag World Veg Fest or hashtag SF Veg Society, the picture with the most likes will win a $100 gift certificate to a new restaurant called Citizen Box in their hair right now. So keep that in mind if you took pictures. And uh, lastly, uh, please come out next year, October 1st and 2nd, is when we're planning on doing our festival. So we'll see you again next year.